Okay. Hello, everyone. So you can see we have a brilliantly titled teaching tonight, Why Things Don't Have to Suck. Um, very important for us to know. Um, but as Ben said, we're continuing on in our study of Genesis. If you remember from last week, uh, we talked about the worst event in human history, the fall, right? When humans turned away from God, decided to live autonomously, to do their own thing. Um, and as a result, the nature of humans was distorted uh, very badly. It, it changed, right? And then they went and they had children. And the nature of those children was also distorted. They, they inherited the sin nature. And so, you know, this has continued on up until this very day, right? And so we're living in this fallen world, in this fallen state um, that the Bible talks about. And it doesn't take much, you know, if you look across the, the world today, you know, you come to this conclusion that something needs to change, right? But, but what? What needs to change? Um, you know, there's a lot of different worldviews on this, a lot of different views that people have on what they think needs to change. On my way home from work today, I saw this car that was painted half black and half white. On one side, it had in big prints, Black Lives Matter. And I was thinking, on the other side, it's gonna have like White Lives Matter or something, right? No, it didn't have that. Um, you know, it had the names of people that have been killed, um, and, you know, black people that have been killed, and you know, that something needs to change, right? No. No justice, no peace, is what it said, right? <clears throat> um, I don't agree with that. I would say no Jesus, no peace Amen. instead, right? But, I mean, there are a lot of different ideas. Um, you know, some think that it's, it's an issue of knowledge, right? We need more education. If people just were smarter, then the world would change and be a better place. Um, some people think that, you know, technology is what's going to save us. Right? We keep improving our technology. Humans are going to figure it out. Um, but we live in a day and age now where we have more knowledge than ever before, more access to knowledge, and better technology than ever before. But things don't seem to be getting better. Right? People are still lonely. Relationships are still hard. Our earth is being destroyed more than ever with pollution. Um, wars are still happening. People are still selfish. And suicide and addiction, well, they're still a thing, right? Um, and so, you know, we're getting into tonight the results of the fall, right? We talked about what happened, what brought about the fall. Tonight we're going to get more deep into uh, what actually came as a result of the fall. And, you know, I want to argue that you know, of all the different views that are out there, like Christianity really is the only one that gives a reasonable explanation for why things are the way that they are today and offers a reasonable solution. And I'd say it's the best that we've got. Um, and the, the garden, the garden is really a picture of how things were supposed to be, right? But it's also a picture of how they will be in the future. Right? God is going to restore things. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And so there is hope. We do have hope. Right? We don't have to be stuck in this everything sucks mentality. Um, but we also have hope in this present reality as well. Because you know, according to the Bible, these impairments that we have now, uh, the damage that was done in the fall can be significantly reversed in our life now, right? Though not fully until uh, God creates the new heaven and new earth, but we can experience some recovery in this life. And the way that that happens is through accepting what God has done for us, right? To get rescued in Christ and to begin to learn what it means to walk according to the Spirit. Um, and through that, God actually starts bringing us back to these lost qualities. All right, so the results of the fall. 
Before we can understand what God has done and how he's fixing the problem, we need to understand what that problem is, right? And it, if I could try to describe the problem in a single word, it would be <laughs> aliens. No, no. Alienation, all right? Alienation. Um, that's the single word. And so... You know, it, it's broken down into four different elements on um, the passage we're going to go through tonight. Um, we can derive these four things, right? Theological alienation, you know, this, the separation between us and God. Psychological alienation, where like, just in our minds, we're, we're divided against ourselves, right? We deceive ourselves. Uh, relational alienation, right? We're separated from one another. We have issues in our relationships. And then ecological alienation. You know, the, the earth, uh, the world around us is, is not the way it's supposed to be. It's kind of opposing us in a sense. And so I'm going to cover the first two, and then Mike is going to wrap it up with uh, the last two. And so before we get into it, why don't we have Mr. Hakes? Hello. Come up here. Oh, go up. Come, come up here. Jesus. He's going to be our Bible reader. Uh, he's going to read our passage tonight. Can I like just sit? Was that trying to register? Yeah, just, just get here. All right, he's going to read Genesis 3, verses 7 through 19. 7 through 19. Okay. Uh, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fake leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Uh, but the Lord God called to the man, where, where are you? He answered, I heard you were in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, uh, who told you that you were naked? Have you uh, eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman... That you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Uh, then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, so and I ate it. Uh, so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife. Apparently that's sin. And ate fruit from the tree. <laughs> Sorry, oh, first, time, oh. first time I've seen it. First time I've seen it. <laughs> Sorry. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Uh, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. All right, thank you. All right, thank you for that great reading. Um, <laughs> all right, so the first alienation, psychological alienation, we find it here in, in verse 7, and it says that their eyes were opened, right? What does this mean? Like, were they blind before? Um, and now God gave them sight so they could actually see what was going on around them? I don't think that's the case, right? I think this really just means that they, they recognized something had changed, right? The way that they see the world around them had changed. You know, God said if they eat from this tree, right, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, like, they will understand good and evil, right? And that's what Satan said to, oh, you know, you won't die. You'll just, you'll know good and evil. Well, that's what happened, right? Um, something was different and they began to see everything differently. And of course, they felt different too, right? Because for the first time, they felt shame and guilt 
because of what they had done. They had never experienced that, never felt that before. <laughs> now, why covering their genitals was the solution to this problem? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I mean, who are they hiding from exactly, right? Everyone that existed at that time, Adam and Eve, God, right, had already seen them naked. This wasn't anything new. Um, so that's, that's a question I'll have to ask God someday. But the most I can say is that this is, uh, you know, this was the best way they felt they could, you know, do something about this problem, right? This new vulnerability they felt, right? What else would they do? Well, that's just, I don't know, don't look at me. Like, I feel strange now, right? Um, and, and something actually changed in their very being, in their psyche. And so, you know, their, their self became divided against itself, right? And, and this is what happens when, when we replace God at the center of our lives with ourselves. Like, we don't have, you know, a real clear picture of how things are supposed to be. You know, what do we compare against? And the Bible actually talks about that, comparing self against self. Like, that's... It's not going to end very well. It's not going to work out. It's going to be confusing. And it's because we were never made for that, right? We're inadequate to take on a God-like role. Um, and so the shame and these guilt feelings, you know, they really led to this insecurity and fear, um, to self-protection, right? To a fixation on self. And so... I actually have a fun little video I want to show you real quick. Um, it just kind of illustrates this fixation on self that we have. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. Oh, what's happening? That's true. Right here. Pinocchio. Want some good news? Get the popcorn now. Check it. That's the best one of the 300 pictures I've taken myself today. Every picture is locked into her phone. So, every single one dialed in. Welcome to parenting in 2015. The world is completely transfixed by the technology. So yeah, come to a baseball game. Can't even watch it. They're too self-absorbed. Wait, the ground left. Uh, selfie with the churro. Uh, selfie just of a selfie. <laughs> 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 I can't get my phone to take pictures. Right. <laughs> Look at the picture of your thumb last week. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is great is that they just keep going back and forth between this, like, oh, there's a pitch. Let's jump back to these girls. <laughs> like, for a whole, like, two minutes. Have a conversation, or you can just completely ignore them. The commentary is wonderful. I love it. But, all right, so this is kind of a... This is the world we live in, right? We are obsessed with self. All right, where did my mouse go? Technology. There we go. Technology. Technology. Okay, so, anyway, we've got this problem. Shame, guilt, we're fixed on self. Um, and, you know, if we start to get this sense in life, right, with, with the fall that uh, we're not good enough, right, that there's something defective about us, there's something wrong. And, like, psychologists today want us to believe that this is the results of you know, the shaming voices of our family origin, right? Like, not a negative Things come from our families, whatever, that's what it is. And I'm sure it doesn't help, but the issue goes so much deeper than that, right? We, we actually feel guilty because we are guilty, right? We're guilty of not honoring God as God, right? We're, we're trying to, to fill this void um, where God should be with self. And... Yeah, we also have this sin nature now that we've inherited from Adam and Eve that is naturally opposed to God, right? I mean, it's actually a, a miracle that anybody ever comes into a relationship with God. Um, in 1 Cor 2.14, it says that 
Uh, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. Right? Like, because of this, uh, this sin nature that we've inherited, like, we just, we don't even understand the things of God. Um, <clears throat> and then in 1 Cor 2.12, it says, For those who are Christians, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, right? And so all this to say that we need the spirit of God to understand the things of God, right? And so with self being removed from its correct place and elevated to a place where God was supposed to be, you know, this terrible sense of inadequacy and inferiority comes to us. And we want to hide. We want to, to change. Um, we want to cover ourselves. It's too dangerous to let others see the real me, right? And so we, we have to look cool, right? Um, we put on this facade that we want others to see uh, or, you know, that we think, you know, others want us to be like. Um, maybe we're that funny guy and you know, we hide behind humor, or maybe we're just the, the quiet guy, because that's easier, right? It's easier just to stay quiet. You know, maybe even in marriage, we have this difficulty where, you know, we may be guarded or afraid to reveal what we are really thinking, because we fear how our spouse may respond to that, right? And we're feeling lonely, and we're feeling isolated, um, <clears throat> And, and we think that hiding is, is going to, to help with that, but it actually leaves us feeling more alienated, right? And, and so deceiving others, that's one aspect of, you know, the psychological alienation. We think we have to deceive others, um, but we're also deceiving ourselves, right? And, you know, without help from the outside um, to, to see how our views may be wrong, we start to believe our own crazy ideas. Um, and we believe things that just aren't true um, and have no one to help point out that error. I was reading an article recently, actually, of a man in Michigan who had become obsessed with this far-right political conspiracy and political movement called QAnon. And... Uh, <laughs> He was so obsessed with it that it affected his mental health to the point where he ended up actually killing his wife and uh, severely wounding his adult daughter, all as a result of his wife and him had gotten into some fight and he just went off the rails. I mean, just mentally he was not, not doing so well, right? Not there. And the point is like when we we deceive ourselves when we're at the center and we're just stuck in our own minds, you know, we can get to this point where we justify our actions and feelings and we fail to see what is actually going on in our hearts, right? You know, it's that way with, with our alienation from God too. We fail to see our need for God. And I mean, I'm, I'm very much guilty of this. I can't stop thinking of myself. Right? I can't stop thinking about how I compare to others, how maybe I look for others. Um, you know, do I seem smart? Right? And is what I'm saying making sense? Am I making a fool of myself up here? Um, you know, I don't know, can any of you guys relate to what I'm saying with that? Do you feel that at times? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> that was rhetorical, but great. Um, <laughs> um, anyway... You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it, right? So I just want to hit a few quick highlights as far as like the solution with regard to this uh, particular problem, right? You know, if the problem is guilt and shame, you know, then the solution to this guilt has to be, you know, God's forgiveness, right? You know, the reason that we feel guilty is because we have sinned against God, because we have gone against God. Um, and so in Psalm 103.12, it actually says that as far as the east is from the west, so 
far has he removed our transgressions from us. This is what God wants from us, or for us, right? Is that our sins, our guilt, are just so far removed from us that we don't feel that guilt anymore, right? That we can move on, that we can have this sense of security in Christ. This is what he wants for us. In Hebrews 9.14, he also says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? God wants to cleanse your conscience by covering you in Christ, right? In the blood of Christ, in the sacrifice that Jesus made. And because our identity was changed once sin entered the world, we need a new identity as well. Um, And in 2 Cor 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, right? He gets a new identity. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And it's only when uh, we begin to make progress in these areas that we're no longer fixated on ourselves. All right. Theological alienation. So this is covered in verses 8 through 11, which uh, John read so wonderfully. And the points I want to make here, I really want to emphasize a couple things. The first thing is that, you know, there's an unrepentant attitude that man has, right? So here God comes walking through the garden as it seems like he often did. um, And Adam and Eve were nowhere to be found, right? Right? Now, do you really think God was unable to find them? Mm -hmm. Uh, That he had no idea uh, that they were hiding, um, where they were hiding, or why they were hiding. Of course, he knew, uh, obviously, or else he wouldn't make a a very good God. Um, But isn't it fascinating that God, in knowing that they sinned, didn't just disappear, never to be seen again? Right? He, he actually pursued after them. Right? Instead, he shows up, um, you know, not yelling and screaming, right? but he comes in and he just asks questions. Right? Questions he already knows the answers to. The questions weren't for him. Right? They were for Adam and Eve. Um, so he comes and he's like, yoo Adam! Where are you? Right? I don't know what the accent's about or the the high-pitched voice. But anyway, the the response from Adam is is significant, right? Because he immediately deflects. Um, He says, I was afraid because I was naked. What does the nakedness have to do with any of it, right? Um, You know, it wasn't... You know, wasn't it not just because he had just disobeyed God? The one and only thing God told him not to do is the very thing that he did. He didn't even know about his nakedness before. What does that have to do with anything? And so God is a little more direct in his next questions, right? And he actually asks, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Now, it's not in what I have shown here. It's what uh, Mike's going to get into here a little bit later. But he deflects again, right? He doesn't take responsibility for what he's done. And I also want to emphasize in this passage that despite their sin, God still pursued them. I think that's huge. I think that's really important for us to know and to understand because it's still true today that despite our hiding from God and doing life in our own way. God is still pursuing a relationship with each and every one of us, right? He hasn't disappeared. He hasn't gone his own way. And that the reason that we don't have God in our lives, that's an issue on our end, not God's, because God has done everything necessary to make a relationship with us possible. You know, we are the ones who are unrepentant and hiding. So to summarize, right, theological alienation, separated from God. Um, the problem is we're unrepentant. And also that we've taken on this, this sin nature, which is directly opposing um, God. And so what is the solution? Well, pretty straightforward. Honor God as God, 
right? They didn't do that in the garden. Um, they went against the very thing God said. They're like, you know what? God must be wrong. Um, I'm going to do this other thing. In Romans 1, I mean, that, there's a nice explanation of this, if, if you read through that, where it's like God has revealed through his creation, right, that, that he exists, that he is there. And yet people fail to see that and fail to honor God as God. That's a choice that they're making despite the evidence. Uh, the second solution to this particular thing is to repent, right? That's the thing that Adam and Eve did not do. They were unrepentant of their sin. They kept deflecting, right? And so we need to stop deflecting. And lastly, be reconciled, right? This is what God wants for us. He wants to reconcile our, uh, the relationship with us. Um, and this is an essential step, right, to reversing the effects of the fall. This theological alienation is at the very root of all these other problems, uh, the other three types of alienation. And so it really starts with this reconciliation that we start to reverse these effects. So I'll hand it over to Mike to finish this out. Yo! What's up, guys? Let's just uh, not waste any time and get right into the next alienation. Uh, We changed it a lot. At first it was sociological alienation, but I thought relational alienation would be better. Makes more sense. Relational alienation. We're divided against each other, right? Like because of the fall, we experience relational dysfunction. Uh, Don't we hear all the time, why can't I keep this relationship together? Right? Like, why can't he keep this boyfriend or girlfriend? Why do I feel alone in a crowded room? Why can't I connect with people? Why can't I express how I actually feel? Why am I so awkward? Right? That's a me problem. Uh, Why do I spend so much time thinking about myself? Why do I compare myself to other people all the time? Our, Our relationships have really become self-centered, which that that leads to this dysfunction that we're talking about. Uh, So during the pandemic, Laura uh, re-watched all of Grey's Anatomy, uh, 18 seasons, 19, 18. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, she loves the show. Uh, I I also watched a little bit of Grey's Anatomy because it was just on all the time at the house. Uh, But there was one significant part where Meredith Grey, the main character, says to McDreamy? Mm-hmm. Or Mc- McDreamy? McDreamy. There's two of them, it's hard. Like one's yes. named McDreamy, the other's McSteamy. That's this is McDreamy. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she pleads with him, pick me, choose me, love me, right? It's all about you, Meredith. Okay, I guess the show's named about you, named? Yeah, okay, you know what I mean. Uh, it's all about her, Meredith. Pick me, choose me, love me. Uh, This is a good picture of that relational dysfunction. We make it all about ourselves. Uh, One of the biggest indicators that our relationships are not what they were designed to be is the existence of bitterness. Uh, There's so many Bible verses that uh, address this issue in our lives. Ephesians 4.25, don't let the sun go down in your anger. So what does that mean? Go deal with the bitterness as soon as possible. Uh, Jesus says over in Matthew 5, there it is, uh, 23 through 24, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with them and come and offer your gift. Uh, So it talks about before you even go and worship God, if you have bitterness in your heart towards another brother or sister, go deal with that first. So this is something to to really evaluate in our lives. Uh, Is there relational dysfunction in our lives? Is there somebody that we're bitter at? And it it could be for a good reason, right? Like some, we, we could get wronged by somebody a very real thing. Uh, But maybe right now, like as we're talking, 
God's laying somebody very specific on your heart that you've been bitter towards for a long time. Uh, maybe tonight's the night that you deal with that bitterness that you've had in your heart towards that person. Or at least tonight's the night that you go to God about it. Pray about that person. Resolve that issue. God so badly wants there to be relational unity in our lives uh, with our friends and family. Uh, what else goes wrong with relational alienation? Well, we have the first blame shift, the world's first blame shift and the world's first marriage, right? Uh, so there's issues in marriage. Uh, I think marriage is great. I love being married, uh, but I know it's difficult. Uh, marriage is tough. Uh, so what happens when, when Adam gets caught in a lie here? He says, it's the woman. It's the woman you gave me, right? He blames God. I'm the victim here. I married the wrong woman. Problem is, there's only one woman at this point in time. Uh, she gave me the fruit. God, you know I don't know how to cook. Right? So what does Eve do? She blame shifts as well. She gets a little Pentecostal here. The devil made me do it. Right? So Adam could have just admitted, yeah, I messed up. Right? Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard this before. There's an old saying, uh, when Adam was away, Eve was led astray. Problem with that is Adam was there in the garden watching this whole scenario play out. The scripture is very clear about that. When the serpent was deceiving Eve, Adam was there and he said and did nothing. So the big question of the day is Adam... Where are you at? Not that Adam. Yeah. Adam, where are you at? This is the missing man crisis of today. Uh, this, this makes me really sad. Uh, there are way, way too many single moms out there. There are way too many children without fathers out there. There are way too many children that have been abused by their dads. And God's asking the men, where are you at, right? At the heart of this question is not a question of location, but rather a question of position. Adam abandoned his role. God created Adam first, then Eve. There was a, a, a position of priority here. The man was responsible. And, and I realize that uh, many men uh, growing up, maybe you didn't have a good father or a good role model. Um, that's not your fault. Uh, if I can uh, quote Goodwill Hunting, uh, it makes a really good point here. Uh, Matt Damon's character, Will Huntington? No, that's not right. Cody, Will where are you? Will Hunting. Will Hunting. Hunting? Not Huntington? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt Damon's character, he's very intelligent, super smart, genius. Uh, but he's not taking advantage of his potential because of abuse from his father. And so Robin Williams' character is trying to like push him to go beyond. Like uh, Matt Damon is just a janitor and he could be so much more. Uh, Robin Williams is telling him, it's not your fault. Your father's abuse towards you was not your fault. Very beautiful scene, great movie, right, Cody? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it did. Uh, it's not your fault. Uh, but it is our responsibility to not repeat that. And so the point here is that Adam saw what was happening and did nothing. Uh, and so what I'm about to say might be a little offensive, but I, I feel the need to say it. Uh, when, when we have passive, weak, cowardly men, women tend to think, fine, I'll do this myself right? Women step up and, and fill that gap or that void. Uh, Eve's intentions were good. Her actions, not so much. Uh, Adam's passivity caused her to fill that gap. And so this is where we have the sin of omission, right? James 4, 17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Listen, Adam was supposed to be the leader here, uh, he's supposed to lead his wife. 
Uh, Ephesians 5 talks about how husbands should be the head of the family. How? Husbands should sacrifice like Jesus sacrificed himself for the church. So being the head of the family does not mean being a bully. Um, Adam had a few options here throughout this scenario, right? He could have just said, yo, Eve, we're leaving. We're out of here. That guy's lying about God. We're done here. Uh, He could have easily said, yo, that's my wife. You stay away from her, right? Um, Sometimes we need to be tough. Uh, Us men need to stand up uh, for the women around us. So um, I have a story here. Alex and I went to a Rammstein concert uh, not too long ago. Uh, Rammstein is a German metal band. Uh, I totally do not fit into that crowd at all. Uh, The people were very rough and tough and pretty big. Alex is pretty tall too, so I felt very safe around him in the mosh pit. But yeah, there was a mosh pit around us and I'm getting thrown around a little bit, but like trying to keep my ground. Amazing concert, by the way. It was awesome. We had a really good spot too, other than the moshers that I hurt my back. It wasn't, anyway. Uh, Point is, uh, there was this tiny girl that gets thrown in front of me. This girl is shorter than Laura. Um, And I'm like, oh, (laughs) I'm like, oh no, this isn't good. And there was like a guy about to trample her. And I don't know what happened, but my adrenaline kicked in. I shoved this guy. He went flying. I'm like, whoa. And so I grabbed the girl's arm, pulled her up. I'm like, are you okay? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, cool. I look over Alex and he's like, and I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) like, it was the coolest thing. I tell this story, like I've been telling this story a lot recently, but point here is us men need to be protectors, right? And and I feel this way in, in the church too. Um, there was a point, is Brooke here? No. Oh, sweet, I can talk about her. So anyway, uh, Brooke uh, wanted to go on a date with some guy she met online, and she brought this guy to one of our hangouts, and I wasn't gonna go to this hangout, but I'm like, no, I need to meet this guy and make sure he's not some creep. I need to make sure that his theology is sound. Uh, I need to just make sure he's gonna treat her good. Like I get in big brother, I don't know, like protected, mode or something. And so like I met the guy and I'm like, so what do you think about substitutionary atonement? Like, what church do you come from? And I'm like grilling him on stuff. Uh, but I guess the, the big point here is I, I wanted him to treat her good. Um, and my hope is that the girls in our fellowship feel safe, um, protected by us men. That's what I want. Um, anyway, let's, let's keep moving along. Third option, Adam in this scenario, he could have asked God for help, right? Like the scriptures said that God was walking with Adam in the garden. Why didn't he just ask God for help? So a lot of men think uh, if I don't do anything or say anything, I'm not sinning. Uh, The problem is when men do nothing, Satan still attacks. Nice guys don't let Satan attack and destroy their friends and family. Uh, If you're always being nice, you're not being a good Christian. Uh, Sometimes we need to get in the middle of situations and defend our people. Uh, One of my favorite Proverbs 27, six, better are the wounds from a friend than kisses from an enemy. To see our friends and family get destroyed or destroy their lives and we just enable that, That ain't good. We need to step in into that situation and say something. And so our culture uh, seems to only view men in two ways, uh, either tough or tender. And so I have a a lion to represent the the toughness and the lamb, little lammy to represent being tender. Um, There needs to be a balance between these two things, tender and tough. Uh, We can't just have men who are tough all the time because then we would have bullies. Uh, And we can't just have tender men because then we won't have men to be able to stand up, uh, stand up to evil things. Luckily, we have a beautiful example of Jesus Christ bringing together both tender and tough. We see this throughout all the gospels. Uh, Jesus knows when to be tough and Jesus knows when to be tender right? With the Pharisees, the religious people that day that were uh, misrepresenting God, Jesus had to be tough with them. He had to stand up to their their false views of God. 
Uh, there was one part in the scriptures about how he materialized a whip, right? So Jesus knows when to be tough, and he also knows when to be tender, right? The little kids wanted to be around Jesus. They sensed that warmth from Christ and wanted to sit on his lap. Jesus knew when to be tough and when to be tender. It wasn't like he was whipping the children and having the Pharisees sit on his lap, right? <laughs> so I, I heard this story about um, a dad and his teenage daughter. Um, this teenage daughter, she, she was dating a guy that just was not good for her. He was treating her bad. And she, she went to her dad and she's crying, saying, I, I don't want to stay in this relationship, but I don't know what to do. It's really hard for me to break up with him. The dad's listening. He's like, uh-huh. Okay, I will break up with him for you. And it's like, what? Like, think about this scenario. Like, the dad breaking up with a teenage boy for his daughter. Like, this is absurd, right? It's such a hilarious scenario. But it makes sense. Like, the dad is not going to be crying about this situation. The dad's not going to go home and listen to a bunch of Taylor Swift and Adele albums to, like, recover from this. No, he's, he's going to go and act. And so he does. He goes and meets with this teenage boy. And he says, you're treating my daughter poorly. That's not cool. We are breaking up. We are done here. And he goes home and he is with his daughter and his daughter is like, how did it go? And he's like, I'm fine. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but then she, she starts crying. Uh, she's very emotional. Um, she's like, well, now I'm alone. Who's going to want to date me now? And the dad like looks at her and he's like, I have an idea. Why don't you go put on something nice? We are going to go on a daddy-daughter date. And so <laughs> the dad knows when to be tough and he knows when to be tender. Uh, and I don't know if you can tell, but I'm getting pretty emotional about this. Um, I have always feared having a daughter. Um, I just have, <laughs> but like listening to this story, gets me super excited to be a protector of, of a possible future daughter. Um, also, I'm gonna need to start collecting guns. Uh, if I've learned anything from Victor, uh, it's have a good gun collection to scare the teenage boy when he's coming over and asking to go on a date with your daughter. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I believe in gun control. I have a gun and I can control you, boy, right? <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> that's a bad joke, sorry. Um, with this point about manliness, I just want to say uh, I have not figured out the secret to manliness. I am a work in progress. Uh, but I do know that us men in the room, uh, we need to continue to step up and continue to learn how to be men after God's own heart, men of integrity, men who are able to speak up and protect our people. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on, on this one, but there is also eco ecological alienation, right? We are divided against our planet. Uh, what was once a, a beautiful place, uh, boom, now this world sucks, right? Like there's natural evils that exist because we decided to throw off God's leadership. Uh, this explains why nature harms us, right? Like our planet is not super safe. Uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, viruses. Uh, also, there's the issue of we can't just go swimming wherever because there's sharks and sharks ain't great. Um, so uh, also, uh, one of my buddies was telling me how he went to Yosemite National Park and he said this was supposed to be like a beautiful sightseeing thing, but there was trash everywhere. It's like I wanted to go and like enjoy the view and like People are just being lame, throwing trash everywhere. So I don't know, this world sucks, not a surprise. Let's get to the solution. That's why we're here, right? We want the positive. What's God's solution? First off in verse 14, which we read already, God begins dishing out judgment towards the serpent. And then in 15, uh, I'll read that here. It says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So there's going to be hostility towards the woman and the serpent, uh, specifically her seed and the serpent's seed. This is offspring. Uh, the seed thing, it's 
kind of weird. Like, if you know 10th grade biology, it's typically the man who has the seed. Uh, I'm not going to get into it, just Google it. Um, but your account accountability partner's going to love that. Uh, in, in the verse, though, we see that Eve's offspring will crush Satan's offspring's head, and Satan's offspring will strike the heel of Eve's offspring. So even though the serpent's going to hurt this individual, uh, we do see uh, in the Hebrew, it's a masculine form of that, that word offspring or seed, depending on the translation. Um, he will crush the head of Satan's offspring. So if I've learned anything from shooting video games, it's uh, a headshot is an instant kill. Yes. So that's good. Uh, what we have here, though, this is beautiful. You guys realize this is the first messianic prophecy. And early Jewish interpreters also agree with this. Uh, it's very interesting. Like, we're talking about Jesus here. In Genesis, chapter 3, Jesus. He is that offspring. Jesus Christ wasn't born of a man, a man's involvement, right? He was born of a woman, virgin birth. We have an instant solution here to the fall. And, and this wasn't like hundreds of years later after the fall. It was instant. God had set a plan in motion. Uh, God says, I'm going to take care of your sin problem. Adam and Eve, though, I mean, they had this pathetic attempt to try and solve their own sin problem. Let's try to sew some fig leaves together. Uh, don't we do similar things, though, with our shame and our guilt? Uh, we try to set up restrictions to avoid sin, uh, but the heart's not being dealt with most times. The problem is still there. Well, let me read this beautiful verse here. Uh, 321. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. They tried to cover themselves up in such an absurd way, uh, but God comes in. He's like, I know you're trying to cover your shame. I know you're trying to cover up your own guilt. Listen, just take that off and let me clothe you, okay? The solution wasn't try harder or like cover up your shame. Instead, it was flee into the arms of a loving God, be clothed by him. Let him rescue you. Uh, let me just read the rest of uh, chapter three here. He says, and the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil. Uh, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Uh, so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, these are like really important angels, uh, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Don't ask me about the sword, flaming sword thing. I don't know. Um, I haven't been able to find anything on that. If, if you do, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, I don't completely understand that part. Uh, just being real with you. Uh, probably a lightsaber, yeah. That <laughs> makes logical sense. Um, so they're expelled from the garden. Um, I don't want to focus on the negative too much. I want to focus on the positive here. Verse 21 is so, so beautiful. He clothed their shame. We need this. That's what we need. Uh, Christianity is so different than any other religion on the planet. Right? It's not that we can earn forgiveness. It's not that we do a bunch of good moral things to outweigh the bad things. Christianity is stop trying to fix yourself. Rather, let God do the work for you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, down here to take on our sin, our shame, and our guilt. He took all that on when he went to the cross. And he took on that once and for all. And we can experience healing today within the group of Christians that we're a part of here tonight. Experience healing in the church. But honestly, the true healing is going to be in heaven. And I want to read one of my favorite verses, uh, Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. 
That sounds pretty beautiful to me. Uh, I can't wait for this. Um, like for things to be made right. No more sin. No more awkwardness. Uh, we can truly relate to God. Like I'll be able to meet the real Ben. And Ben will be able to re- meet the real me. Um, we get new bodies. I'm excited about that. Uh, also, I have some friends with disabilities that are very much looking forward to getting a new body in heaven. Like, do you all see how amazing this is? How amazing this message is. The message that, yes, our life sucks, but it doesn't have to. Uh, the message that God did all the work for us, even though we were against him. Brothers and sisters, we cannot keep this to ourselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, I'm done. Let's get Nick up here and we'll take some questions and comments.